Hey, what's up, guys? And we are live. Welcome to the Fox Red Sierra podcast, episode 21. Here we go. Welcome back to the Fox Roads here podcast. Once again, this is your host, Franco Sonera. All right, a couple quick announcements. Uh, Instagram, follow me on Instagram at the Fox Roads here podcast, uh, where I post uh, very short clips and short videos. Uh, for example, uh, I'm, I'm starting to do um, like quotes with uh, certain figures of like both World War I and World War II history. I just did one of uh, General de Gaulle. Go over there. Give it a like on your way in. <laughs> and all right. Uh, secondly, uh, YouTube. Uh, YouTube search. Um, this is how you search me on YouTube. Uh, the Fox Show Tier Podcast, uh, where you can actually see this lovely logo right here. Yep. Give that a subscribe. Give my videos a like so I can level up on that algorithm. Because I want this content out there, guys. Uh, Reddit. Um, I just posted a uh, recent uh a picture of uh the battle of uh, Cap Young and during the Korean War. So go over there and check it out. Uh, TikTok. Uh, I did a little TikTok thing at the Fox Show Sierra podcast. Same thing. And yeah, uh, like and uh, subscribe to the channel on your way in here, guys. And all right, that's it for the announcements. Okay, now let's uh. Rewind to the last episode where we talked about the uh, Do Little Raiders, uh, followed by uh, the Coral, the bat both battles of the Coral Sea and Midway. Okay, for we uh, went over the uh, the timelines of the Japanese expansion, uh, starting with the attack on Pearl Harbor, then it started taking uh, possessions in the Pacific. Uh, mainly, what they wanted was the uh, the Dutch East Indies. That's where they uh, they had their the vast uh, oil, vast oil supplies, right? And then, of course, we went over the uh, do a little raid on why uh, why that operation happened in the first place. It was more like a symbolic attack, saying, "Hey, America can attack back." And it was the uh, the first country to uh, hit Japan in their own turf, and many, many, many hits to come. <laughs> and then also, of course, we went over the about the Coral Sea, where they kind of lost the. Uh, one of the carriers, the US, USS Lexington, and crippled another one, the USS Yorktown, which uh, came out, which was in quick repair, uh, went over to sea just in time for Midway, and guess what? Gets hit again. <laughs> and also, um, we went over one to the uh, various commanders, uh, both like the US and the Japanese, uh, especially uh, the three guys, uh, three Japanese men. Uh, Admirals uh, Yamamoto, Nagumo, and Yamaguchi. All right, let's uh, let's talk about the fate of these guys and what actually happened to them later in the war. All, all three of them did not survive. There, I said it. Uh, spoiler alert. Uh, Yamamoto. Uh, he was actually shot down. Uh, on I think it was on his way to uh, some sort. Of, I, I gotta look that up. I, I should know. I should know this stuff, though, but I should do, like, a separate piece on uh, yeah, certain, like, figures of history separately after I go over through uh, events of the Second World War. Though, but for instance, um, Yamamoto was shot down on his in route on his passenger, on this, uh, not passenger, this, this troop, tra this, uh, I don't know, transport plane. Uh, how, they how the U.S. found out was that they intercepted the um, the messages uh, thanks to uh, you know guys like Rochard, 
Uh, so he ended up getting shot down and killed. So that was a huge, huge uh, blow for Japanese morale. Uh, of course, uh, Nagumo and Yamaguchi. All right, during the battle midway, Yamaguchi, uh, after when his uh, aircraft uh, carrier was uh, severely damaged, they had to uh, scuttle it so it won't be fall into enemy hands. However, uh, Yamaguchi wanted to go down with the ship, and so he did. Uh, a few of his sailors wanted to go with him, but uh, Yamaguchi was like, no. Basically, you young sailors needed to go elsewhere for the sake of the emperor. So, as noble as, you know, as touch as he was, though, but he, he can't, like, you know, let these men, like, you know, die with them. It's not fair that they followed incompetent orders from their fellow officers, which is, you know, Yamaguchi. He took response and he took accountability for the failures. That's why he went down with the, uh, the aircraft carrier Hiwa. Oh, I'm sorry, the Hebrew. Correction, Hebrew. And Nagumo. Uh, later in the war, uh, during the Battle of Saipan, uh, long story short, he committed Sapuko. Or Sapuko. Which is, he ended up like, you know, Japanese version of self-deletion. Uh, basically, uh, the Battle of Saipan was like, the Japanese defeat was so bad that uh, Nagumo could not face another defeat. So he rather faced death than the ultimate surrender. So he committed seppuku on himself. And yeah, that's it for those three men. And uh, yeah, more following those men later throughout the the pod, uh, throughout the, uh, the, the episodes about the throw at you guys. Uh, okay, now, what you've been waiting for. Okay, the North African campaign. Okay, you're probably wondering. Okay, we had war in Europe. We had war in Asia. Uh, why North Africa? Why the Balkans? Why the Middle East? Hmm. Well, let's uh, let's take it back to one of my episodes on uh, Mussolini, shall we? All right, uh, Benito Mussolini. Hang on for a sec, guys. I just got to do something here. All right, so while I fix something here on Instagram, okay. Uh, Benito Mussolini, like, he, he wanted to uh, expand his uh, Roman, uh, his, uh, he, he wants to expand the, his new Roman Empire. And so uh, he had great possessions in Libya, along with, uh, I think, Italia, Somaliland. And he wanted to take uh, Abyssinia, which is today's Ethiopia. And so he did. Uh, Britain and France tried to um, conduct sanctions against this uh, against this man, or against okay against uh, Mussolini and the Italian Empire. Though, but the uh, well, let's just say that um, let's say the uh, the sanctions were more symbolic. Now it, it didn't really have an effect on the uh, on the Italian Empire, so they they just took what they wanted anyway. So, and that they did, and at the same time, uh, Mussolini and uh, well, not the same time, like later on, like during the um, during the Battle of France, uh, Italy did declare war on both France and Britain because he wanted to expand his Roman Empire. He wanted to take British possessions. Uh, in uh, Egypt as well, and and British Somaliland. He wanted to take uh, French North Africa too, too though. But when the French surrendered, when the uh, when, when the uh, when 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 the uh, the armistice was signed, and France became Vichy France, uh, they were considered a uh, German puppet state, so Italy couldn't touch him. So. Mussolini was like, nine, 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 nine. There goes my, there goes the west side of Africa that I wanted. All right, well, I guess I'm going to go to the east side. What's on the east side of Africa? Well, there's Egypt, yeah. Well, why Egypt? Well, uh, Britain has this little possession in there. Uh, that divides between Africa and the Middle East called the Suez Canal. 
Oh yeah, which we will talk about more later. Uh, pretty much uh, the um, well, I'm gonna show you right here in a sec here. Okay, right here, this picture right here. That is the British Empire. Uh, circa uh, between 1914 and 1939. Uh, not much has changed ever after the Second World War. Britain still had their uh, empires. I think they had a few more after the war. Uh, though anyway, um, look at the uh, the, the line streaks across the oceans. Those are the shipping routes uh, that the British uh, possess. If he, if you guys actually see uh, Africa, if, uh, where Saudi Arabia is and where Africa is, or, or the Horn of Africa is right there, right? And I will zoom right in. Okay. Britain needs oil, and Britain needs food. Britain needs food through the Atlantic, which we talked about in our Battle of the Atlantic episode. And also, they need oil from the Middle East and from the Indian Empire as well. And there goes the shipping routes right there. And in order to do that, they have to go through the Suez Canal, stop by over at Malta and Gibraltar. Uh, Malta was a... a Interesting fact about uh, Malta. Uh, well, we will talk about Malta for sure. Uh, long story short, uh, it is kind of a thorn on Hitler's foot. We will talk about more of that later on in the podcast. Okay, anyway. Uh, yeah, so there you have it. So the Suez Canal is of vital strategic importance for Britain. It is a survival line, like the last line of, of British survival. They're, they're, they're barely hanging on to the Atlantic already as is during that time. If they'd lose the Suez Canal, Britain might as well uh might as well call for peace. Cuz yeah, like, you know, lose lose the uh, the canal, lose the war. Okay. So, before I show you the Suez Canal, let's talk about uh Mussolini's uh military itself, like were they good? As uh, the Wehrmacht, were they excellent as the U.S. Army or the Commonwealth Army or the Red Army? The answer is, unfortunately, no. And you're probably like, what? What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. Okay, shout out to my Italian fans. My Italian supporters out there. But seriously, uh, even Italians will tell you this. Um, even back then, um, okay, even though the uh, the Italian military... At the time, where there were great numbers, especially in the European and African side, they outnumbered the British in Africa. Uh, however, uh, their equipment and their weapons were somewhat second rate. Uh, they were kind of like uh, kind of a little bit more older school for its time. Uh, their air force, their most of their fighters were biplanes. While the rest of the nations were already using uh, single wing planes like Supermarine Spitfire, uh, the Messerschmitt BF 109, and such, right? And of course, uh, again, like I said, the uh, the troops uh, didn't have much training. They didn't have much training because their officers didn't put the uh, initiation to conduct that training, to conduct discipline, to conduct military. Dish- uh, military uh, military uh, dress in deportment. The reason why is because the mass majority of the Italian officers were too busy abusing their rank, uh, getting free meals, going on dinner dates, like pretty much like showing off, like you know, their stats, their clout. Going, yeah, look at me, I am an officer. Come to dinner with me, and I'll show you all these places because I'm an officer. Look at my uniform. And little did they know, they forget what what's the most important getting your troops at the ready getting them combat ready why do you think the Wehrmacht was so successful uh, during the beginning well they had like continuous training along with themselves along with themselves plus crystal meth <laughs> go back to my um Battle of France episode and the and the uh, collab I did with DL Saint. Uh, by the way, uh, go to DL Saint's uh, Real One Old podcast. Go and subscribe there on your way in. So uh, anyway, yeah. Uh, also, I did one with him at the uh, on my Pearl Harbor breakdown. He was my surprise guest. So go and check it out. Uh, anyway, 
uh, back was thinking about the Italian officers. Yeah, they were too busy living luxurious lifestyles. I just put it that way. And overall, the Kingdom of Italy wasn't in the best economic nor military strength to even wage war. So, but Mussolini wanted to expand his empire anyway. So, but it is what it is. So, there you have it. And now, what all you've been waiting for. I just got to pop this out for a moment here. And guys, <laughs> like your video on your way in because what, what kind of a uh, content creator will, will give you Google Maps who give you stuff around the world, baby? Oh, excuse me. Uh, right. Okay, so I just got to get a Google Earth ready because I'm just about to take you around the world. There we go. All right. So let's uh, zoom out of the world here just to just see where it exactly is. Okay. So you have the Mediterranean right here. This is North Africa. Okay. So right here is Libya. Egypt, Tunisia, and you have Algeria and Morocco. Okay, Morocco and Algeria, they were, they were French, uh, French, uh, French possessions uh, known as French North Africa during the time. Uh, uh, but yeah, pretty much uh, Libya right here was an Italian possession. Uh, right above here, uh, this is uh, Ethiopia. Uh, back then, Abyssinia at the time. And, uh, of course, uh, there was British Somaliland, and there was Italian Somaliland. Uh, Somalia was both divided at the time. Okay. When I say Horn of Africa, guys, this is it. This is what I'm talking about right here. The Horn of Africa. There you have it. So, and here is India. Back then was the Indian Empire, British Indian Empire. And so, since they're having a hard time trying to get supplies from North North America to the Atlantic, thanks to Germans U boats. Check out my uh, my battle battle of the Atlantic episode. I'll I'll tell you more of it. Okay, so Britain has another supply route: the Indian Empire and Persia. Uh, I, uh it's Iran today. So, uh, that's where that's where the British get their oil. So, well, what? There you go. There is the uh. The shipping routes going through the Horn of Africa, through the uh, what's that, the, the Red Sea, and then up to the Suez Canal. And as you can see, this is of most vital importance. And of course, there's Greece, which we will talk about more later. There is the other member of the Axis powers, Italy. And you have this thorn on the axis shoe called, is this Malta? I'm sorry, this is Malta. No, 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 no. Where is Malta, guys? All right. There it is, right underneath Sicily. Oh, sorry, guys. I thought Malta would be over here for some reason, but it is not. So, Malta is considered kind of behind enemy lines. Uh, Malta is a, uh, a quick uh, pit stop for aircraft and ships for refueling and such, right? And of course, the Italians wanted it, so they tried bombing it day and night. Well, I'm not going to talk about Malta yet. Not yet. Anyway, so... There you have it. That's why uh, it's so important. So they get through the convoys. Sorry, they get through the convoys. They, they get through the Suez Canal, which is over here. Then they go to Malta, refuel, and they go to, to uh, Gibraltar, which is right here between uh, Spain and Morocco. And they sneak right behind the German U-boats and right to, right to the United Kingdom. So there you have it. That is why the Suez Canal is so important. Okay, 
let's talk about the Mediterranean fleet strength right over here between the British and the Italians. Okay. Britain has uh, 45 combat ships along with 12 submarines, while the Italians had 183 combat ships and 108 submarines. Okay, so again, the Italians do have the numbers. The training and the equipment, however, that is another story, guys. All right. Okay, so uh, let's... Uh, Let's uh, do a little story time. Back to episode 17. Uh, when I did the Battle of Britain. Remember when I talked about Operation Catapult? Okay, so after France's defeat on the 22nd of June, 1940, the uh, the Germans like, the Germans did swear not to use the French... Um, uh, the, the French uh, fleet that were anchored at Mir uh, Mirz El Kabir, which is up in uh, northern Algeria. Uh, though, however, uh, Winston Churchill, in his good, good hindsight, did not believe him at all. So he dispatches uh, Task Force H under the command of Admiral Somerville. Uh, the task force consists of the uh, the carrier, the HMS Ar uh, Ark Royal. Along with battle cruiser HMS Hood and battleships HMS Valiant and HMS Resolution, uh, and other, of course, other minor crafts coming from uh, Gibraltar, which I showed you previously on Google Maps. Okay, so uh, Admiral Somerville did the best he could to um, to to convince uh, the French admiral at the time, uh, Admiral Marcel Brito Gensel. Uh, to either give an ultimatum, either you can scull your ships or you can surrender them to, to us, right? Or no one as you know, you can sail with us, be part of the free French, and uh, we, we kick the Nazis' asses together. Uh, you know, we, we can spank that ass together. Uh, though what the uh, uh, Admiral Gensel was kind of like, you know, really, really, really stubborn about this. Like he, he didn't want to talk about surrendering his ships, period. Uh, in fact, that, that day was, it was, it's Algeria. So I was going to say it was a very hot day, though. It was, it's North Africa. It, it, it's hot. It's hot. I All right. And tempers are flaring. Uh, people are, sailors are already moody already as is, especially in the current situation at hand. And so, uh, Admiral Somerville really didn't want to give the order to open fire at his own allies. So he ended up resigning. And of course, uh, uh, Admiral uh, Andrew Cunningham ends up being. Um, oops, uh, ends up being appointed um, uh, commander of uh, Task Force H. Okay, even the the ultimate has been delivered to the anchored French forces. Um, however, they did they didn't expect a uh, a barrage from British ships, so they they were trying to call out their bluff, saying. No, they were not firing on us. Let's just keep smoking our cigarettes and uh, keep said everything or some well, whatever, right? So, but they they really didn't take them so because they, they never would have thought they're not like our but those are our, our, our old friends, they're not gonna fire it at us, they're not gonna lock them up at us. So, but however, um, <sighs> does not work because, um, Task Force H was given a time. If they don't get a message, they will open fire. Because remember Operation Sea Lion? Remember the German amphibious invasion on southern England? Churchill cannot have that happen. So, Task Force H did what they had to do. Locked and load. Fires at the uh, the French ships aboard. Uh, the French ships, Dunkirk, the Strasbourg, the Bretonnage, the Mogador, the Lennox, and the croissant were severely damaged or sunk. And yeah, so this is one of uh, Churchill's hateful decisions. And in fact, I think this is kind of, you know, uh, enhances drinking problem that I really had right then and there. So it, it made it worse. <laughs> and of course, uh, to add insult to injury, the Third Reich, especially our good old pal, Joseph Gibbles, the, uh, uh, the, uh, <laughs> 
the Nazi Ministry of Propaganda takes advantage of this uh, by saying, you see, this is Churchill. This is your Churchill. This is your so-called savior. He fires at his own allies. Are you willing to fo follow Britain? Yeah, that's what he was using. And uh, the French, especially the uh, the French Algerians there, like they, they remembered it. And oh yeah, it, it comes to haunt the, haunt the Allies a couple of years later, which we will talk about. All right, all right. I'll talk with those two later. Okay. Actually, you know what? let's talk about this right now. All right. All right. So, um, I think it was like near like the summer of 1940, Mussolini decided to launch his uh, his expansion of his Italian Roman conquest. And so he invades uh, Egypt, uh, capturing the town of Sidi Barani. Okay, uh, God and left, uh, General Archibald Wave, uh, General Archibald Wavell. Uh, he was the commanding officer of the uh, the Middle East uh, forces, uh, especially the the WEF, the Western. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, the WDF, the Western Desert Force. Uh, the Western Desert Force. Can't even talk. The Western Desert Force. There we go. <laughs> uh, which consists of uh, British, East Indians, Australi uh, Australians, New Zealanders, and South Africans. Uh, later, the uh, the WDF kind of reassembles to the eight, the British Eighth Army, which we will talk about more later. And okay. Uh. Okay, so on uh, December 1940, at the end of, an end of 1940, uh, the Western Desert, Desert, that Desert Force ended up uh, flanking uh, the occupied town of C City of Iran because the uh, the Italians would have thought that you know the uh, the British were going to attack them head on. No, so, uh, nope. the The British kind of somewhat fl easily flanked around their defenses, kind of went to kind of went to the side of the, the south of the town, uh, which uh, this kind of tactic will. Uh, We'll be a little bit more familiarized later on as I go through this. But anyways, uh, long story short, uh, the British take City Barani uh, with uh, 40,000 prisoners. And uh, not only that, uh, already, already the situation and for the Italians is already going to shit. Because they already lost uh, 500 miles of land. Uh, because the Italians, I'm sorry. Uh, the British were chasing the Italians all the way down to uh, El Acalia. All right, which I'll show you again in a second. Okay. Pop Google Earth again. All right. All right, back to around the world. All right. There is Al and Kayla. All right. And over here, uh, this is what they captured, uh, the Italians. Now, of course, uh, the British had to withdraw temporarily just to take it back. Okay, the towns were thought uh, the British were going to attack through here, but instead, they flanked around through the south and ended up chasing the Italians from city to city. Well, let me zoom out here, all the way down to by uh, El Acara. Oh, El, sorry, yeah. <laughs> El Aquilia. There we go. Which is... Yeah, it was right here.
All right, so can I remember this uh, this point over here because this becomes end up the uh, the rallying point for the Axis uh, forces there, including the Italian uh, forces and the uh, the Africa Corps, which is the uh, the German military there uh, stationed in North Africa. Okay, so Operation Compass was the success. Okay, uh, in fact, uh, Churchill was uh, confident enough to. Um, divert troops over to Greece. And you're probably like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Why Greece? What's going on over in Greece? Ho, ho, ho. Okay. This is going to blow your socks away, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Okay. Why Greece? Okay. So let's... Uh, Let's talk about April 1939, when Mussolini annexes uh, Albania because he wants to expand uh, further into the Balkans. Uh, he and because uh, was it while he was trying to uh, expand in Africa, uh, he talks to Greece, talks to the Greek uh, government uh, sometime in October 1940 uh, as a, uh, I pretty much given a invitation. To um, to be part of the Italian Empire, of course, the Greeks were like F you. They didn't want they don't want any part of it. So of course, the Italians locked and load, invaded Greece through Albania, and of course, uh, once again, just like uh, Sidi Barani, really didn't work out for the, the Italians in Albania because already. Already, the Greeks were were kind of, you know, spanking that ass. Like, I'm telling you guys. Like, it was not looking good for Mussolini, like... <laughs> and, of course, not only they pushed Italians out of Greece, though, but... Right once they advanced through half of Albania. Of course, Churchill sees this as an opportunity to... Get rid of the uh, the Axis forces out of the Balkans once and for all, suppose. But in paper, anyway. So he withdraws half of his forces in Africa to go help the Greeks out. However, that really doesn't work out for um, for both the uh, the British and the Germans. Because all right, let's just uh, go over the timelines over here. Now, the timelines of the Balkans. Because uh, this all happens in 1941. Uh, from April to, like, in one month, guys. One month. All right. At the, at the 6th of April, uh, heavy bombing of uh, Belgrade. Uh, Yugoslav High Command was completely paralyzed at this point. So, the Yugoslav military cannot operate. Uh, of course, at the same time, the 6th of April, uh, the, the first uh, Panzer Corps uh, invades from Bulgaria and reaches Belgrade. And on the on the twelfth of April, uh, the 9th of April, uh, Germans take uh, Salonica. Oh, remember we talked about Salonica during the First World War? Oh yeah. Uh, finally, another war later, they finally take that city, <laughs> uh, trapping uh, the Greek troops defending uh, the Metaxas line. As you can see right there. Uh, on the 9th of April, at the same time, uh, the. The German motorized court reaches Monastir. On the 10th of April, uh, British start to fall back from the Alakamon line. Uh, the 11th of the 12th of April, uh, the Hungarian army overruns parts of northern Yugoslavia, which then annexed by Hungary. So, you can see the Hungarians there trying to reclaim lost territory from the First World War. Uh, 16th of April, uh, Sarajevo falls to the Germans. Uh, 20th of April, uh, the Greek First Army ends up surrendering. Uh, 24th of April, uh, the Germans break through the uh, the British positions at Thermopylae. Uh, 24th and 30th of April. Uh, so the British and the Greeks end up evacuating from Praeus and Ports and Peloponnese down to uh, the island of Crete. Uh, 25th of April, uh, the German paratroopers end up dropping down at the island of Crete, uh, taking uh, Corneth. 
I wish we'll talk about more about the, the whole paratroopers in, uh, in Crete. Uh, 20th of May, the German airborne actually invades the island of Crete. And the 28th of May through the 1st of June, British and Commonwealth troops, of course, elements of the Greek military, evacuated from... from... Safakia Sa- 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 to Alexandria. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry I pronu- uh, mispronounced that name. Uh, so anyway, uh, from the from the Crete Island to back to Alexandria, which is uh, British Egyptian headquarters. Okay. There you have it. And of course, let's uh, let's talk about the uh, the invasion of Crete. Uh, so uh, Hitler had possessions of uh, divisions of German airborne divisions and uh, fleets of Stuka dive bombers. So he takes advantage of that and goes for the kill. Okay, so the invasion, however, was effective. It took them two weeks to take the island. Okay, so 15,000 Allied soldiers evacuated. Uh, of course, the Royal Navy took heavy losses uh, of, of their own trying to evacuate guys from uh, Crete to uh, back to Egypt. And oh, and uh, the Germans kind of lost uh, paratroopers of their own, especially they were gunned down while they're in the air. In fact, I'm kind of show you a, a video of it. Okay. All right, so we see uh, German paratroopers taking off, and here is the, the British defenders, and they're and some of them were being picked off while they're in the air, and they're already dead before they even hit the ground. And so Hitler pretty much uh, never, of course, the Nazis never ordered a major uh, operation involving paratroopers for for the remaining for the remainder of the war, because they couldn't you know stand those kind of losses again. Uh, which kind of didn't really make a blind of a difference between uh it really didn't make a blind of a difference because they lost the war <laughs> anyway okay let's uh talk about okay re- reason why I showed uh general Claude uh uh Alkin like is because he ended up replacing uh Wavell. Which I will tell you later. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about the uh, the German adversary. Okay, so not only uh, Greek uh, Greece was a uh, catastrophic disaster for the Allies, though, but while Churchill was moving troops from Africa to Greece, Hitler was already dispatching. Um, Troops to uh, Africa already as is, and okay, l- let's let's talk about the reason why Hitler bailed out his buddy Mussolini. Okay, he had two choices: he could either um, help him or just leave him to his fate. If he would have left him to his fate, uh, his entire southern flank would be completely exposed. So he couldn't have that. That's why he invaded the Balkans. That's why he invaded Yugoslavia and Greece. Uh, however. That did pay off because they now have access to the entire Mediterranean. And of course, more land. So uh, him bailing out his buddy paid off. And to uh, to add more, he dispatches uh, his top general slash former bodyguard to Desert Fox himself, Erwin Rommel. <clears throat> Let's uh, let's talk about Erwin Rommel, shall we? Okay, so while uh, Churchill was dispatching uh, troops from Africa to um to Greece, Hitler was sending his best general to Africa, helping the Italians take back their possessions. So Hitler dispatches uh, Rommel over to North Africa to take command of the famous German Af- Africa Corps. Uh, so, because also a reason why, because Hitler saw Mussolini's failures in Africa and Albania, uh, not only, uh, is, uh, compromising, um, Axis, um, 
What do you call it? <sighs> What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, anyway, uh, Hitler saw Mussolini's failures in North Africa not only expanding, not only expending Axis materials and manpower, but possibly, you know, leaving the South fully exposed. Oh, uh, sorry, I, I couldn't figure out the word I, I wanted to use before. Though, but anyway, at this point, uh, he saw Mussolini more of a liability than an asset. At this point, so whatever he's kind of like, you know, say it. I'm going to expand my territory anyway. So, but yeah. Anyway, he dispatches uh, Rumble over. Okay. And, of course, the Desert Fox starts uh, assembling at uh, El Acagra and starts invading. Uh, starts taking back uh, key territories. Okay. So, he already has successes during the Battle of France, because remember... I we uh DL and I mentioned him before in uh, our previous episodes. Uh though therefore that's why he was suited for the job. So uh he arrived in Africa uh in February nineteen forty one, uh pushing Wavel and the uh the Western Desert Force back. Uh so uh not only the Germans uh expand past El uh they push away from Benghazi as well. And of course, the uh, the ninth uh, the ninth Australian division surrounded in Tobruk. And of course, let's uh, I want to show you Tobruk again, shall we? All right. All right. Taking it back around the world, baby. All right. Let's zoom out here. Okay, so this is uh, Romo's starting point. Already he's... Uh, he already took Benghazi. He already took all all this territory. Now, of course, uh, the 9th Australian Division is bunkered down and to Brook. So, Romo tried to... Uh, to take to Brook, though, but the Australians, the Aussies, they were so well fortified that Romo was just like, F- it. He leaves the Italians, you know, to for them to deal with because he wants to uh, chase the uh, the British down down past Egypt, uh, down to uh, what do you call it, the Hellfire Pass. It's right here. Of course, this battle was so bad the British literally nicknamed it Hell. Fire pass because it was so much death in here, guys. Okay, so this is where uh, Rommel ended up uh, reaching. Well, the Australians were bunkered down into Brook for guess what? 200, 240 days. They hold out, and of course, oh, this is really, really expending Axis materials. So it, it, it was hurting the Axis pretty badly. Okay, so um. Rommel ends up fortifying fortifying the uh, the Hellfire Pass, which is yep yeah, right here. Uh, okay, so but he the reason why he halted there because uh, he couldn't advance further because he, he he's low on fuel, he's low on supplies, so he's got to bunker down until more supplies can be in route. So, but however, that's kind of an issue as well because as you can see here, the island of Balta is kind of interfering with it because they still have functional warships that is disrupting and harassing uh, access convoys. All right. No, but Churchill orders Wavell to uh, attack the Hellfire Passes. He tries. He fails. In fact, uh, uh, Wavell was unable to, uh, to to, to break the deadlock. So, Churchill ends up reassigning him to India and appoints our good old buddy Claude Nicholson. And so uh, Claude Nicholson ends it up um, uh, re, uh, what we call it. This is where he uh, reforms the WDF, the Western Desert Force, uh, along with fresh reinforcements to the British Eighth Army. So 
uh, November 1941, uh, Operation Crusader took place uh, to regain the uh, the areas of uh, Tobruk and to relieve the Australians. It succeeded at the 7th of December. So, Tobruk is finally liberated. So, the Aussies, you know, they're, they've been rescued for the time being. Uh, so, once again, uh, Rommel was forced to withdraw all the way back to Alakera, back to the starting point. So wait, he's not going to be there for long. All right, so let me close this map over here. For a minute. All right. On the 21st of January, 1942, uh, Rommel was ending up being reinforced with troops and new tanks. Oh, he's getting new Panzer tanks, new Tiger tanks. Oh, these are sophisticated tanks. Uh, no, we're not talking about the Panzer 1s here. We're talking about the Panzer 3s and the Panzer 4s, uh, which were heavier tanks with heavier armor. Uh, not as heavy as the Tiger tank, because the Tiger tank is... Oh, that thing is a cannon, though, but fortunately for the Allies, they were few in numbers. Okay. Uh, so he launches another offensive. Let's open up Google Earth again. Sorry, the reason why I have to close uh, Google Earth on and off just so the thing doesn't lag on me. I'm running through wireless. I know, I know. I should get wired, though, but uh, I just can't. I just need a long-ass wire to do that, though. But <laughs> it's in the works. Don't worry. Okay, so anyway. Uh, Rommel conducted his second offense. Goes all the way, recaptures uh, the cities, uh, Benghazi included. And, of course, uh... Uh, so uh, sorry, got have brain for it. Alkinlek ends up holding the call, uh, uh, fortifying uh, this uh, this line called the Gazella Line. Wonder if I can type it right here. Nope, that's not it. All right. Anyway, that's uh. Let's talk about the uh, task at hand here. Okay. So, let's say the Gazelle line's right here. They hold off, including they, they hold off their flanking lines as well. However, that doesn't work because this is what the Desert Fox is famous for. Uh, he ended up uh, moving his tanks through south through the covering of night, plus making his own uh, sandstorms uh, during the daytime using his supply vehicles to run around back and forth, uh, producing uh, dust, in the, dust in the wind. Just for additional supplies and tanks can roll through south. And also doing this in the cover of night as well. And by morning, Rommel strikes. <laughs> so he strikes uh, the gazelle line. And... What you call it? Uh, so the, the British ended up withdrawing from the Gazelle line. And on the 20th of June, 1942, Rommel takes Tobruk. Uh, what the Italians tried to do for 240 days, Rommel took just Tobruk in a single day because there was nothing standing him because he took the, the, the Gazelle line and there was nothing stand, standing between him and Tobruk. So he just takes the city. And the British... I had the withdrawal to the Egyptian border. Uh, 32,000 troops in Tobruk were taken prisoner. And of course, not only that, 2.5 million gallons of fuel and other supplies were left behind in Tobruk for the Africa Corps to take, along with 2,000 vehicles left behind. Ho oh, ho. Even Churchill says himself, defeat is one thing. Disgrace is another. Yeah. So this defeat was so humiliating that he, he really needs a breakthrough. So in addition, uh, Rommel pushes into Egypt, taking Mercer Matruth, defeating 5,000 Indian troops completely slaughtered. 
And so Auchinleck and the Eighth Army will draw to Alamein, which is right over here. And of course, once the Nazis do take Alamein, there's nothing stand between them because there's Alexandria out in the open and there's the Suez Canal. There he is, right there, boom. So this is what happens when the first and second battle of Alamein actually happens. Okay. Now, so going through the timelines of um, of the Battle of Tobruk, before Tobruk was taken, before the Gazelle Line was formed. Okay, so at the 24th of March, uh, Rommel's first offensive from Alakelia, uh, so in April 1941, starts the first siege of Tobruk. Uh, May 1941, Rommel's offensive reaches Saloum. 15th to 17th of June 1941, uh, British Operation Battle Axe fails and is driven back to the start line. 18th of November 1941, British launches Operation Crusader. And the 8th of December, 1941, Tobruk was relieved. Once again. The 31st of December, 1941, Rommel withdraws back to El Achillea, back to the starting point. And the 21st of January, 1942, Rommel launches his second offensive. And the 4th of February, 1942, where it all goes down, they halt to Rommel's advances at, at the Gazella line. So I, you can see this bouncing back and forth game right here at this map. Yeah, I just wanted to like run through that with you guys. And okay, let's uh, let's talk about the uh, the Battle of Elamain. Okay, actually, let's uh, pop Google. Okay, there's a reason why that British were were able to hold the Nazis uh, at Elamain really good. Uh, because due to uh, desert terrain itself. All right. Okay, so the Allies kind of fortified a line over here. In the south, however, uh, you'll think, okay, Roma can just flank them from the south. No, they can't. Because there is this area called the Guitar Depression. Actually, if I can just... All right, so this was, I guess, um, okay. Let me just zoom over here for a sec, guys. Okay, the I was looking at the map from nineteen from nineteen forty two. Like the the guitar depression was so different. It was a lot bigger, a lot longer. By a lot longer, I mean it kind of stretched all the way down to uh, the south of uh, Elamain. Uh, hang on, guys. Oh, I really need a director here. <laughs> all right. Okay. So the guitar depression actually stretches. Actually, you know what? No, 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 no. It, no, I was right. This is the pressure right here. Okay, the Allies held a line, touching between the uh, the the Qatar Depression to the sea. Okay, the Qatar Depression kind of consists of pretty much quicksand. So even if you try to uh, go through uh, tanks and jeeps over there, like it, it will just be bogged down and sink, and then they'll be picked off by artillery. So that's why it was perfect to to guard its southern flank. So. So, so Rumble really couldn't do his famous uh, flank and maneuvering tactic. Okay, so uh, the 1st of June, 1942, Rumble attacked, but again, it was bogged down with well fortified British defenses. Uh, both sides does uh, sustain uh, heavy damage uh, due to well fortified British defenses. 
Uh, so he kind of so uh, Rommel en- ends up drawing back uh, to his line. Okay, let's just close that for a sec. All right, let's just uh, talk about the key players, shall we? Okay, so even though Auken like uh, pushes uh, Rommel back, uh, Churchill was really devastated by the British or by the Commonwealth losses in Africa. So he flies to Cairo himself, uh, you know, for uh, like a little meet and greet, uh, boosted uh, the morale of the troops. Not only, not only that. Oh, but he wanted to fire Auchinleck and a couple of uh, and a few other uh, uh, high guys in uh, the higher echelon command of the Middle East. So, especially Auchinleck, he fires him and appoints these two guys to take on this guy. Okay, who's this guy and that guy? Okay, <laughs> the guy on the left is Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery. Monty, and he also uh, Churchill also dispatches uh, Field Marshal Sir Harold Alexander. So these two are co-commanding against uh, their adversary, uh, the Desert Fox, Field Marshal Erwin Rummel. And so this uh, conducts the uh, the Battle of Alam El Helfa. Okay, this right here. This is when. Uh, Rommel tries to do his famous flank maneuvering tactic. No, but it, it really does not work out for him very well. Okay, because he tries to attack the uh, the ridge of Alamel Helfa. I uh, tries to uh, go through the Qatar Depression, though, but his tanks end up being bogged down anyways. And also, the uh, the Royal Air Force stationed in Egypt kind of practically destroyed a handful of tanks at the ground as well. And ends it up uh, falling back outside Alamein. And fortifies the line between the uh, Depression and the sea. Uh, fortifies the shit out of it with landmines. In fact, uh, the Allies, our side, kind of had a nickname for this called the, uh, the Devil's Garden. Okay. So, in case if uh, the, the Allies attack the line, uh, the Panzer divisions were kept in reserve in case if they do break the line. That's what. That's why if they do break through infantry, they're going to be met with tanks. So that was the whole idea of it. Okay, so uh, that flank and moving didn't work, so he had to withdraw back, which ended up being the uh, end up the uh, conducting the um, the second uh, battle of Elamain. Okay, so after the fall of uh, Tobruk. Uh, Churchill went to FDR, our good old buddy Franklin D. Roosevelt, for help. Of course, once again, during during that time, he couldn't really commit troops to uh, to the European theater yet. Uh, however, uh, remember the Lend Lease program? Yeah, he ends up uh, dispatching uh, how many numbers was it? Uh, Three hundred Sherman tanks to Africa. Oh yeah. Monty and Alexander's got some Sherman tanks, baby. And these th- tanks can actually keep up with the Panzers. And so now the Africa Corps were now out- outnumbered two to one. Because you, you have British first, because the British lost like most of their equipments in Dunkirk and most of it in Africa as well, because you know, trying to hold off the or find out the Italians and the Germans. And so uh, they're in dire need of supplies. So thanks to the, to the land lease program, uh, Monty, or oh, actually the the British armor now has Stuart tanks, Lee tanks, and Sherman tanks. Oh yeah, good old made in the USA. And that's how they work. Because again, they they have personnel, but not enough equipment. Now they do have have that equipment. There you go. Oh. <laughs> Dom the Monko. <laughs> Alright. Anyway. Oh uh, yeah, my, my uh, I, I need a new uh I need a new head I need a set of uh, headphones because mine keeps like crackling and disconnecting on me, so it's a nuisance. <laughs> uh where was I? Okay, so 
Oh, another new good news. Uh, British, our British, our good old uh, British intelligence, uh, Ultra, uh, good old base in uh, Beshley Park, uh, intercepted a con- intercepted convoy routes between uh, Africa and Europe, thus cutting off uh, rumbles from additional supplies up to 70%. Remember, uh, remember our good old, our good old Maltese people? Oh, yeah, they're, they're making shit happen, baby. Woo! Okay, so, so Monty, okay, so Montgomery knew uh, the Devil's Gardens were well fortified. So uh, during the uh, the first uh, phase, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Operation Lightfoot. So on uh, the 23rd of October, uh, during nighttime, he conducts a artillery, artillery barrage while the engineers go there in the middle of the night, try to disarm the landmines. That doesn't work very well for them. So they had to w- withdraw and conducted another operation a week later called Operation Supercharge. Uh, therefore, attacking the north end of the, uh, of, the de- of the Devil's Garden. This succeeded. Why it succeeded? Because Monty was just like, F- it, mate. I was going to send everything I fucking got. All right? So that ends up working. Because, again, he has all these reinforcements, all of these American-made equipment. Boom! Just shoves rubble right through there. Okay, so Operation Supercharge was was a success. Uh, so the Eighth Army, let's change that. Uh, so they they succeeded in pushing rubble back all the way once again just to their own starting point at El Acalia. Oh, and not only that. Pushes him back even further. Okay, hang on. Oops. All right, let's uh, let's take you back around the world. All right. All right, straighten this map out here. Okay. Okay, so right here this is where the the axis starting point. However, Monty's reinforcements ends up pushing them back even further, past Tripoli, down to the Tunisian border. Okay, so Rommel ends up fortifying his positions. Though, what, however, what Rommel should be doing is look behind his shoulder, because guess what's going on behind him, over in uh, French North Africa here. Oh yeah. The USA baby coming right in to whoop that ass. Because you remember, um, remember the the Vichy French are still public governments of the Nazis, and the Vichy French uh, still has possessions in uh, France, Syria, and French French North Africa. Okay, so before I talk about that, let's talk about Malta. Okay. The pictures that you see over here, uh, the left picture over here, that is Malta after... It, that, that is a typical Tuesday for the Maltese. Yeah, uh, being bombarded to shit every day. From the Italians, and then by the Luftwaffe. Uh, the one to the right of the picture, that is, is a Luftwaffe picture, uh, an aerial picture of parts of the island just being bombed the living shit out of. Uh, the middle, uh, the George Cross was awarded to the Maltese people, and it's 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 still there to, in Malta today. That is the uh, most hot. It, it's like the uh, the civilian Victoria Cross for the British. Uh, basically, they gave it to Malta for pretty much like holding out, going above and beyond the call of duty, and helping to defeat Hitler, and which they did because. The Maltese people were were being bombed day and night, day and night, day and night. All right, so in 1940, Mussolini did have his eye at Malta, which is, of course, a British colony. Uh, and it's also an island, remember I told you, uh, that island was of strategic importance, allowing aircraft and ships to refuel. And it also uh, acts as a forward operating base to harass Allied shipping convoys. 
And so uh, Mussolini in- initiated bombing campaigns on the island for two years. Two years, guys. And so, uh, even though Malta had little to defend, they still repelled them. And of course, uh, remember what I told you about the uh, the British and Italian navies being outnumbered? Well, uh, hang on, let's just remove this over here. Oh, no, 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 I don't want to show you that video. Okay, at the 11th of November, 1940. Uh, Britain ends up launching a uh, an air raid at the Italian port of uh, Taran- uh, Taranto. All right, so let's just go back to Google Earth for a sec, and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about here. Okay, so this is where the bulk of the Italian Navy is. All right, and remember, um, what ha- remember our last episode where we talked about the the majority of the Japanese uh, naval power being destroyed by carrier based power. I'm oh, sorry, carrier based aircraft. Oh yeah, same thing happened here. So that so end up happening. Uh, this is of course the uh, the Battle of uh, Taran- uh, Taranto. Uh, so twenty one swordfish aircraft. Remember, remember those biplanes that ended up uh, shooting down shooting. Shooting down the Bismarck. Oh yeah, they use those so-called uh, obsolete biplanes. They end up being great torpedo-based planes, and they ended up uh, destroying a whole bunch of uh, Italian warships in harbor, including uh, like half of their battleship battleship fleets. Now, of course, the um, the Italian fleet had to withdraw all the way down to Naples, and at which, in addition, more RAF fi- fighters and more RAF uh, uh, World Navy fighters end up. Destroying like the vast majority of the Italian Navy, because like what the Japanese have learned, and of course with the Americans as well, uh, air power is very excellent in destroying sea power because it worked at Midway, and guess what? It also worked at uh, Tar- Taranto. Now, of course, that ended up crippling Italians' uh, naval power. Once again, Hitler's really seeing Mussolini as more of a liability. Man, okay. Oh. Okay, so again, Malta is in dire need of help right now. Okay, so... Uh, so, it, the Italians really couldn't... The Italians really couldn't... Uh, Keep up with the bombardments anymore because uh, this is what Malta had to defend itself. Uh, the Sea Gladiator right over here. Uh, they had a few of those over at Malta until so they were kind of replaced or kind of they're kind of uh, <coughs> excuse me uh, replenished by submarine Spitfires, which end up shooting down a whole bunch of Italian um, bombers, which they have on top. Which is the Sparrowhawk at top? Okay, so this is what the towns were using to bomb uh, Midway, and yeah. Okay, that I will show you all later in this last slide because we are almost wrapped up here. Okay, so they, uh, so the British did whatever they could to. Uh, to, to prevent Malta from falling. And so, uh, the British uh, assembled uh, uh, flotillas from both Gibraltar and Alexandria, uh, and they both uh, sailed simultaneously down to Malta. But they were intercepted by uh, by the Kriegsmarine and elements of the whatever lost the Italian Navy. Uh, they ended up uh, being destroyed so badly that I think, like, or was it only three? I'm oh, sorry, sorry, only two. Two two out of the 17 ships made it to Malta. Of course, it, it was just enough to hold them for maybe at least a couple more, a few more days. Though it wasn't enough. So, at the, at the 3rd of August, 1942, the Allies conducted Operation Pedestal, which is one of the most 
biggest flotillas ever assembled before the Normandy invasion. Okay, so uh, they set sail from Gibraltar. So this consists of 14 merchant, uh, merchant ships with heavy escort. And these heavy escorts, uh, they have two battleships, four aircraft carriers, seven light cruisers, 32 destroyers, four corvettes, four minesweepers, and 11 submarines. Oh, yeah. They, they, the Royal Navy ain't <laughs> round. I'm telling you guys. Okay, so it took them two weeks to get there. And after two weeks of heavy, heavy, a heavy, heavy bombardment, like uh, five merchant ships ended up making it to Malta, which leaves them just enough supplies to uh, to hold off, including crates of new fighters, Supermarine Spitfires, baby. And of course, what is the cost of Operation Pedestal? Uh, one aircraft carrier was lost. Uh, two light cruisers, one destroyer sunk, and some more damage. Uh, of course, uh, tw- 27 access ships were destroyed, uh, thanks to Malta being resupplied uh, between uh, September and October 1942. And that's how uh, the Maltese end up uh, being awarded the St. George Cross, which was the end of November. All right. Now. Operation Torch. This is the American amphibious invasion of North Africa. Okay, so when the Americans uh, entered the war, they wanted to enter Europe right away. Though, but both FDR, Winston Churchill, and the Allied High Command knew that the Americans weren't exactly combat ready. They haven't been in a major war since the Great War, the First World War. However, other countries like, you know, Britain, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, India, were been at war since the beginning. But we we're, we already lost two allies: the Dutch, the French, uh, especially the French. And of course, uh, Britain has our Commonwealth buddies to uh, hold the line. And of course, when America declared war, because remember, America was a very very resourceful country, and so uh, the Americans had lots of recruitment and lots of new equipment. Ships that are brand new, fresh out of the harbor. Uh, troops that are just fresh out of basic training. Because one day there were there were like you know, shopping clerks or teachers, and now they're sailors. They're soldiers now. And also, the reason why they want to uh, to go to Africa is uh, to give them uh, what do you call it a uh, uh, more like a uh, hands-on training for what's about to happen. So they, they kind of need to break break in the American troops in. So they conducted. So that's why they thought, okay, let's uh, let's invade uh, access held territory of uh, French North Africa. And they thought that it was going to be an easy one because um, because the French were American allies and they were American friends for quite a very very long time, even um. FDR uh, made an announcement in Algeria in French saying, hey, we're Americans. Don't shoot. We're good. Remember us? We're friends. Remember uh, remember the American Revolution? Yeah, you guys helped us out. Remember, we, we ha- you gave us the Statue of Liberty. Guys, it's us. It's the USA. You're good old buddies. Right? That's what pretty much... Uh, FDR saying saying and like I, I'm just I'm just paraphrasing the living shit out of that though. <laughs> you get what I mean, right, guys? Okay. And so not only that, like the American ships were flying huge American flags. Even the American troops have American flags on the helmets and and their armbands, indicating that we're Americans. Don't shoot. However, the 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 French in Algeria really didn't give a fuck because. Firing at the Americans as they were landing. And you're probably, why is their own friends attacking them? Well, the French really haven't forgotten uh, Operation Catapult. That's why I kind of showed you the uh, that first slide there. Because they really haven't forgot that. They really, really haven't forgotten the British firing at their own Allied ships. 
No, but they they really haven't forgot for uh forgot nor forget about it. They haven't forgotten about it, and they haven't forgotten about it. <laughs> and so the French do remember that, and the Americans are paying the price for it, even though it wasn't them that shot the ships. Though, but hey, they're on Britain's side, so they got to take the heat for it. It uh really really didn't take them long. To uh well actually it really didn't take the uh the French admiral there at Garrison to uh really like kind of like you know surrendered back to the Allied side saying you know what this is stupid we, we shouldn't even attack each other like I don't even want to fight with the Germans anyways I want to fight against the Nazis and so they so the uh, the French uh, forces in Africa ended up uh, switching sides joining the Allies and however that 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 made Hitler go nine, 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 nine. and ended up annexing Vichy France. So, in order for his uh, southern flank to not be exposed, he sweeps and occupies the rest of France. Because he believed that the Vichy, the Vichy government could no, no longer have the strength to defend itself. And okay. Let's uh, let's talk about the timelines here that kind of was like leading to uh, Operation Torch. Because remember the uh, the offensive against the Gazelle Line. At the same time, American troops were already landing. So let's go the, through the timelines because we are almost out of time. Whew. All right, twenty sixth of May, nineteen forty two, the start of Rommel's offensive against the, the Gazelle Line. Okay, the end of twenty first of June. 1942, the Germans and the Italians take Tobruk. Uh, the 30th of, of August, 1942, Rommel attacks on El Amain halted. Uh, the 23rd of October to the 2nd of November, 1942, Allied victory at El Amain. That's the second battle. This is where they start to push back the Axis forces. At the 4th of November, 1942, the 8th Army starts pursuing of retreating Axis forces. Okay, so the 8th of November, 1942, we go to the west side. The United States Western Task Force lands in Morocco. After overcoming resistance by local French forces, began eastward advance. And of course, uh, the 8th of November, 1942, uh, the Eastern Task Force, the U United States Eastern Task Force, meets with only light resistance during the landings at Algiers. Uh, the 10th of November, 1942, the Germans land reinforcements and Tunisia. Eighth, uh, oh sorry, that's a question. Thirteenth uh, of November, November nineteen forty-two, the Eighth Army recaptures Tobruk. Uh, okay, twenty-third November to the thirteenth of December nineteen forty-two, Rommel makes a stand at El Akalia, but is eventually outflanked by the Second New Zealand Division. So, the Kiwis. Uh, practically, uh, use uh, Rumble's own tactic against him. Ho, 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 that whole flank and maneuver thing. Oh, we're learning. We're learning, Rumble. Uh, so, uh, the 23rd of January, 1943, the 8th Army enters Tripoli. Oh, yeah, they're, they're right up Rumble's ass this time. All right, including the Americans as well. So, the 26th of February, 1943, the American forces... Halt Axis counteroffensive and the Kasserine Pass. So, uh, Rommel tried to attack the Americans uh, westward instead of eastward. Because he kind of figured, you know what, if I attack the Americans, it will be a lot easier for me because they're not exactly uh, combat ready. Or they don't have that combat awareness. Unlike the British, because we've kicked the rise so many times to the point where they're actually learning. So, you figured that in order to uh, cut his losses, He'll attack the Americans first, which was a mistake on his end because the Americans ended up holding him off at the Kasserine Pass. Uh, the 22nd to the 26th of March, 1943, uh, New Zealand and British forces outflanks Axis defenders off the Merith Line. And the 7th of May, 1943, Allied forces captured Tunis, which is right in southern uh, Tunisia. And the 10th of May, 1943, having withdrawn the Cape Bond, the Axis forces 
finally surrenders. Dom the Marco Marco. <laughs> well, there you have it, folks. That is the North African campaign for you. All right. Let's uh let's do a quick review, a quick story time on uh, Romo's fate. Okay, so Hitler really couldn't uh ex uh Rommel L for his failures, just like the Japanese couldn't uh remove Yamamoto and Nagumo away because uh for one, uh these figures of uh, Rommel Nagumo and uh Yamamoto, they, they were they were big, big figures. Not only they're not only well known to the Allies side, but to, to their own people as well. Uh, Yamamoto would actually uh, go out of his way to write letters to children. Uh, he would have uh, letters of sailors that he would lose, that, that he lost under his command. Uh, and then there's Rommel. Joseph Goebbels like, pumped up his Nazi war, uh, Nazi war propaganda machine so far to the point where he made Rommel, you know, Superman. So again, Hitler really couldn't, you know, X him out. So they kind of, you know, reassigned those. They end up, uh, well, what the Axis leaders did to those men, they kind of like, you know, you know, they kind of did like, you know, uh, forgive and forget, you know, sweep everything under the rug, you know, just, uh, just to not, to not let their people know about their failures. Because if they found out they're failing, you know, people lose hope. When people lose hope, they lose morale sinks down. When morale sinks down. You have chaos and disorder. They can't have that. So that's why they kind of quite, uh, swept things under the rug. And re- and Hitler ended up ends up uh, reassign- reassigning Rommel to the uh, North Atlantic Wall, which is dividing between Northern France and the English Channel. So he assigns them to refortify the fortifications at the North Atlantic Wall, of course known as Fortress, uh, Fortress Europe, and Rommel at this point really, really thinks that Adolf Hitler is completely fucking nuts at this point. Like he even says himself, his uh, his Atlantic Wall is something that's dreamt of out of a cuckoo land fantasy world. Again, I'm just paraphrasing what he's saying though, but it's something along those lines. Like at this point, like Rommel really thought that Hitler is you know off the yang and needs to get, you know, needs to either get his shit together or step out of office. Though we will talk about more about Rommel's fate later in the podcast. All right. Because with that being said, uh, that is it that I have for for you guys. Uh, next, uh, to, actually, the Tuesday after, I, I got to figure something out here. Uh, my full time job. They're 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 getting me like hundred kilometers there, hundred kilometers back. Like, oh, they're they're sending me further away now. <laughs> Not cool, dude. But hey, I'm a tradesman. It is what it is. The way anyway. Um, I'm the vibe between uh, Operation Barbosa or the First Winter War. I might do a survey. To see, you know, what you guys think. No, let the internet decide. <laughs> All right. My my voice is really, really getting tingly. <laughs> no, anyway. I will let you go, guys. Though, but shut this off. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for tuning in. Dom the Marco. Marco. No, anyway, I will let you go. In the meantime, what's my ultra? Oh, here it is. All right, here it is. Talk to you later, guys. Peace.